Welcome to the first of a really two-part celebration of 20 years of the BMO Winterset Literary Award. I'm Maureen Golfman, I'm chair of the board, and I'm delighted to be with you again for the Winterset and Summer Literary Festival, whether in person here in Eastport or virtually from afar. The Winter Set and Summer Literary Festival respectfully acknowledges the territory of the Eastport Peninsula on which we are gathering as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic. We also acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. Part one of our celebration honors the BMO Literary Award winners from 2000 through 2010. Not all of the award winners could participate in this film you are about to see, but we are very grateful for so much insight and good humor from those who could show up. We thank filmmaker Roger Mondar for putting this elegant tribute together. This is a fitting reminder, not only of the terrific writers whose work has been forged in this province, but also the value of awards just like this one. The late Richard Gwynn had the idea for the award in the first place. This is an award to honor writing of any genre, quite unusual, and he brought BMO in to ensure the prestige and value of unique achievement. And we think Richard would have enjoyed the film you are about to see. So then after a short pause, you're going to hear and see a conversation I had the pleasure of hosting with all the BMO winners from 2011 through to 2019. I had a great time chatting with these talented folks. It was a humbling and unforgettable experience that I had, and I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Thanks to Richard and to BMO for its continuing support of our rich writing community. The BMO Winterset Award is designed to encourage and promote excellence in all genres of writing. Published literary works written either by a native born Newfoundlander and Labradorian or by a current resident of the province are eligible. Both emerging or established writers may be considered. The award is sponsored by BMO Financial Group and the Sandra Fraser Gwynn Foundation. The first 10 recipients of the award were, in 2000, Michael Winter, This All Happened. 2001, Michael Crummy, River Thieves. 2002, Joan Clark, The Word for Home. 2003, Robert Mellon, Tilting. 2004, Ed Rich, The Nine Planets. 2005, Joan Clark, An Audience of Chairs. 2006, Kenneth J. Harvey, Inside. 2007, Kathleen Winter, Boys. 2008, Randall Meggs, Nightwork, The Sawchuck Poems. 2009, Jessica Grant, Come, Thou Tortoise and 2010, Russell Wangerski, The Glass Harmonica. Stan Draglin writes about how uh, having a place written about makes it more real and more concrete and more alive. And I, I feel like uh, I've been one of uh, a small army of people who've been making Newfoundland feel more real and more concrete and more alive through uh, the way that we're telling our stories about the place we come from. A festival like the Winterset is, is, is like a seed pod that germinates out into, into book clubs, into word of mouth reviews. It's a, it's a kind of exposure that um, you, can't, you can't buy. Uh, it's, I guess, Newfoundland's premier, first uh, literary uh, festival, um, celebrating fiction, poetry, non-fiction, uh, just celebrates uh, uh, great Newfoundland writing. We've tried to create a kind of cluster of attention around the best writing in this country and certainly this province. Just to have the opportunity to share your work with others, to, to meet people uh, and uh, to have a kind of a celebration. It's absolutely invaluable and uh, it's a lot of fun. There's very um, intense and, and deep conversations about the books. Such respect is given to the books, right? Like they are very closely read by the people who are hosting the panels and also by the audience. I think that these awards draw attention 
to the writers, to the literature, and they just bring everybody together. And having a, a place to gather and celebrate that, I think, is really a, an essential part of the whole culture of the, the writing community. Can you explain to me what the Winterset Literary Festival is? The Winterset Literary Festival, as far as I understand it, was a festival that was started kind of as a companion to the Winterset Literary Award. Um, and it uh, takes place every summer in Eastport. And uh, it brings Newfoundland and Canadian and international writers together for a, a four or five day festival every summer. The festival is an interesting thing. I mean, the festival to me is, is such a, a, a a captured small package of the world. You have a bunch of people show up in a, in a relatively isolated rural location who know all about your book, know you, know you if you're walking down the side of the road, ask you questions if you're in the grocery store picking up bacon. Um, it, it, it's a strange kind of instant fame on a really small scale, like you suddenly feel really important. You know, the whole area, the landscape of the area is so beautiful. I remember being happy to be driving out there, to be honest. Like the, the approach is beautiful, you realize where you are, it's the, the place is so nice. And also all these events, any of the literary festivals, um, but particularly the ones in the, in the East Coast, there's, um, there's a real camaraderie with the other authors that are there. You know, you really feel good to be around them. It's absolutely inspiring to go to something like that. And if you haven't been working well lately or working much lately, you know, it, it, uh, it gives you a real kick in the behind to get out there and do something. And, and, and to feel part of that community is a, is, a, is a very big thing for me, too. It gives audiences, readers, a chance to actually meet writers, which is not something that, that happens out of, say, book signings in major cities. And that kind of exchange is invaluable, I think. And I think for, for writers who spend most of their time alone, and spend most of their days sitting alone in a room banging their head against a desk uh, and wondering why the hell they're doing what they're doing. And the opportunity to be out in a public setting with people who have, have read their books and, have, and to be able to interact with those, with those folks and to feel like, well, actually, I, there is an audience for, for, for these stories. Um, I, that's an incredibly important thing for, for writers, I think. Uh, Richard Gwynn wanted to honor, who was then his late wife, Sandra Fraser Gwynn, um, and honor the place that she grew up in, which is here, Winter Avenue, in fact, and hence the name Winterset, and wanted to establish an award in, really, her memory. In the mid to late 70s, there was this burgeoning uh, of talent and a kind of explosion of creativity here that she acknowledged. And just that kind of acknowledgement itself was what I often call a kind of tipping point of self-awareness for readers and writers and cultural producers. And so the award was established in her name and then we needed a venue to showcase all these writers who had been nominated. And so one thing led to the other, but the award was the generating principle really of the festival itself. I was fortunate to be able to meet Richard. His, uh, just his, uh, his demeanor, he was very sharp. Uh, he's a really interesting guy, Richard, uh, because he, I mean, he knew everybody and had written about just about everybody and, uh, and was an incredibly uh, thoughtful guy. Edith Goodrich, she was absolutely central and a huge part of the festival right from the start. She would sweep through uh, the green room, she would introduce, she would speak at the beginning, but more than anything else, you got a feeling that she had like an extremely long arms reaching around the whole concept of the festival. She was uh, one of a, a number of people that I, I uh, was privileged to meet at, at that festival. So it was a great chance to really uh, meet people that I didn't customarily uh, see, especially the writers. Whenever I'm out of Newfoundland, I'm always asked, well, what are, what's in the water down there? Why are there so many great writers from Newfoundland? And it does seem disproportionate. 
and I don't really understand why that is, other than I think that uh, the place is full of storytellers, and that that's a fairly natural extension of that. Um, the, the, the writing community here, I can't really, sp I, obviously I can't speak about any other one, but it's, it's, it's very collegial, uh, it's, it's not, there's no sort of com competition, and, and it's small enough that like, when you have events like the Winterset thing, it's like, uh, it's a reunion in a way, it's a, a bunch of friends getting together. I think the most memorable moment for me was uh, waiting backstage before going on to be um, interviewed. Backstage with Michael Crummy and Lisa Moore and we were just laughing like we were having a really good time and I would have otherwise been really nervous but because they were, um, they just put me at ease and we were having such a good time that uh, that it wasn't scary at all. I moved home about a year before uh, I won the Winterset Award. I was just amazed by the breadth of the artistic community and amazed by how interconnected it was. And there was a real sense of camaraderie, like there was a real sense of, uh, of the rising tide, you know, floating all boats. It's, uh, it, it's, it just speaks to the sort of uh, creative, artistic nature of people in Newfoundland. I think that's been one of, the, one of the reasons why I simply, you know, as I mentioned, I've traveled all my life and I moved around all my life. I came here, I just stopped moving. I just felt at home here. There's great writers to work with here. They're fascinating, funny, giving, and, and the thing that's really surprising here too is that so many of them are so different. It's a, a very helpful, very supportive community and, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that everybody knows everybody else, but everybody sort of works in the same planetary system. It's kind of a family. One of the things the award and the festival made me realize is that it was certainly very good for the, for the book, for, the, for finding readers for the book. Um, it also, like I said, gave me confidence that what I was doing was the right thing for me to do. That I had made the right decision in, in deciding to write. And it gave me confidence that if I wrote, you know, um, there was a community of readers who might want to read what I wrote. And that was, um, was wonderful for me as a writer. There, there's almost daily uh, hints that maybe you've made a mistake by committing your life to this particular endeavor. So when something like that happens, you know, that suggests, no, this is, I'm doing the right thing with my life, that's, uh, that's an invaluable, um, that's an invaluable experience. The, the book business in Canada is tough for a lot of reasons. Diminishing numbers of readers, diminishing numbers of publishers, um, and a very award-centric ability to get your book out there. Um, for me, what it really helped with was my next book. It made my next book that much more uh, attractive to a publisher. I'm sure other authors are going to say the same thing. You know, it's a very lonely existence. People might be more sympathetic to it now after the COVID lockdowns and stuff. They may better understand what kind of a life a writer has. And at a certain point in the book, I mean, you don't know if, if you're going to connect with the world at all. You, you look at it after a certain point going, is this, this utter nonsense? Is this just ravings? Uh, so that kind of approbation. But yeah, just the acknowledgement that you're, it's really, really, really important to, uh, to authors, I think. Uh, I had no expectations, you know, but it was still incredibly gratifying to, uh, to be recognized that way. And, uh, and the money in the life of a writer is absolutely <laughs> essential. It makes a huge difference. Like uh, whenever that kind of windfall comes into a writer's life, it means that they can keep writing. And that's what it meant for me. The, the fact of the matter is that most writers uh, in Canada have another job. Now, sometimes if they're lucky, that job is ancillary to writing. Um, you, you might be working in a creative writing program at a university, you might be an English professor. Uh, 
you might be doing other kinds of writing. But making a living from writing alone, even with Canadian granting agencies, extremely, extremely difficult. The, the space between the devil and the door is very small. You know, I'm not just a writer. I, I just do a lot of things. That's why my output is not as, as high as a lot of people. I, I work with wood. I'm a gardener. I'm, you know, I'm out in the back country a lot. I find sometimes when I'm working on my lathe, an idea will come to me. I get out the old notebook. I get a lot of notes from my poems uh, when I'm in my workshop. And people have asked me, you know, is there a connection between the two? And, and when I think about it now, you know, I think that there are really quite a few connections between my, my writing and my, my woodwork. In my, in my wood, what I'm always looking for is flaws. I'm looking for, like if you can see in that piece there, flaws in the wood, and you can work around those. It makes it much more interesting, or, or something like this with a natural edge where I'm leaving the bark on it. You know, that's the kind of thing I'm looking at. These are the art pieces. Uh, or, or even this little piece of walnut. I mean, what's most interesting about it is that bark inclusion right there. So how does that connect to my, my writing? Well, I mean, what are we looking for when we're writing something? Is something different, something unusual? Uh, the kind of people that we're interested in creating or talking about, you know, are people that have something unusual about them, that the flaws what, what often what we consider unattractive in people can be the most attractive thing about them. And I think that maybe right now that's a, a, a really timely topic in terms of being able to accept things that are different from what we are. What's your favorite thing about writing? That's a very good question. Because it's not fun. It reminds me a little bit of training for a marathon. You know, like it's just a, a daily slog uh, and often doing things that are completely unnatural for the human uh, creature to be at. <laughs> it's kind of an agony, uh, particularly a novel. If you're writing a novel, uh, you're, you'll never get a good night's sleep because when you have your moment of wakefulness, your head goes back right into the project. Yeah, the first novel, uh, I was uh, in my early 30s when I started, and uh, I realized very early on in the process that I was not ready for a novel. And there's something about the size of the undertaking uh, that I think it's a completely unnatural thing to do. I don't like the solitude. There are all kinds of points in that process, I think, where you just want to quit. Um, and I felt a little crazy. Uh, and I've since realized that that's just part of the process. And you just, you put your shoes on and you do it. And try as much as possible to ignore how you feel. But for uh, writing the first draft of, of that first novel was really uh, one of the least pleasant years of, of my life in some ways. Uh, I don't like the hard work. Um, I love first drafts. Um, by and large, when I work on stuff, I don't know completely how it's going to end. Because I often feel that if I know how it's going to end, it's finished. We're done. Um, a lot of writers like editing, like going over their work with a, either on their own. They may edit it four or five times before they're done. When I'm done the first draft, I want, I want to be rid of it at that point. I want to be doing something new and fresh. What's my favorite thing about writing? Oh God, I don't know. Um, I just enjoy the process of, uh, of slowing down a little bit, trying to think about what I'm writing. And, uh, and it actually amazes me that I could ever get any books published if only Mrs. Cornforth from my grade eight English class could see me now. She felt that I was totally incorrigible. I could not parse, parse a sentence to save my life, you know, but I think she'd be quite proud of me that I actually could put a sentence together at, at this point. I actually like the process of going back and um, reshaping and revising and refining things. But the work, the actual sitting down, the discipline to sit down and write is, is no fun at all. I think if you live in Newfoundland, 
there are so many interesting topics, so many things that have not yet been written about. If I had any advice to give, it would be to look at everyday situations with a new perspective, with some curiosity. And I think that's what, uh, what many fine writers have done in Newfoundland. They take ordinary situations and they look at them very carefully and, and somehow manage to uh, really uh, tell stories. One of the most important things, I think, is if you're a poet, you need to read poetry. You need to know about the history of poetry. You need to see what people are doing with it. And the same thing would apply if you're a writer of fiction. I, I used to find that a lot of the students d didn't read poetry, didn't read novels, and they were, but then they were going to write them. I, I think that you, you have to know what's going on, you know, before I think you can do it. Be as professional as you can and recognize yourself as a professional from the start. Um, do a job like it is a job. And that means dedicating the time, the training, the experience, the education from anywhere you can get it to do it right and not do it as a, as a one-off. If you're going to be a pro, be a pro. Um, I, I think the challenge for a festival is to make sure that you have people, I mean, we're a volunteer board. We do have a kind of modest staff complement, but, you know, we're working within our means, within our resources. So the challenge is to keep the, the funding going, our sponsors happy. I should call it the BMO Winterset Award properly because BMO has been a really, really important partner and supporter of this award and so uh, a lot of credit is due them and people we've worked in over the years uh, from BMO who've not only just supported the award financially but attended the festival, been really active participants um, to grow the audiences. I mean I think with COVID as with a lot of festivals we realize we've got the possibility of a wider reach through digital streaming. And that's not something we should just turn away from now that we're going or moving towards more in-person attendance again. Having a larger audience is important, I think, because really the mission of the festival is to reach as many readers as possible. So it's about kind of balancing your resources against what's, what, what you dream about for a festival, which is just uh, recreating and enhancing every year that kind of wonderful experience of um, a kind of uninterrupted conversation in a in a beautiful environment over three four days. I think the smart money, the smart money, would say that uh, people don't read much, and especially uh, outside of a larger center, you're not going to find many people who are interested in books or in writers. And I think what a, a festival like the Winterset Literary Festival in a place like Eastport does is it, it proves how false that is and how important books and reading are to uh, people everywhere. Welcome everybody, all you BMO Winterset Prize winners, an illustrious group we have here today. Good afternoon and thanks so much for being so up for a panel like this. I wish we could all be in person. In fact, we're hoping that we are all in person watching this in the beaches, at least all of the winners uh, in August when this will be streamed to the big wide world. So a big congratulations to all of you for having uh, achieve the BMO in the first place. And um, we're hoping for a lively conversation over the next hour and a bit and hear from all of you about, um, you know, what the award 
means to you and a little bit about your work and anything else that comes up. I asked all of you to select, given the limitations of time in this format, two or three sentences or a short paragraph from your award-winning work, uh, if you don't mind reading it and um, think of all the books you can sell just from those two or three sentences. And um, tell us a little bit about why you think the passage you've chosen captures something about your award-winning work. And I think probably the best way to do this is to go back in time with the 2011 winner, because we're going from 2011 to 2019 uh, with Dawn, um, who I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourself, Dawn, and the title of your book, and we'll work up right to 2019. So take it away. Uh, okay, thanks, uh, Noreen. Um, I actually misconstrued the question, so I thought I, I chose a, a passage from liberally from my entire corpus. <laughs> <laughs> While I was, uh, I, I'll do that if that's all right with you. I'll take a, a poem that's very short. Sure. Came to me uh, yesterday while I was out in the bush and I was listening to uh, uh, Purple Finches. Um, this is a series I've been working on uh, forever called Songs for the Songs of Different Birds. And uh, this is a song for the song of the purple finch, uh, which is uh, great. And it's now, it's just starting to sing now in the, in the woods. So it's, it's fabulous. And what I really like about it is kind of kind of halfway between speech and song. You're not really sure whether it's talking to you or singing to you. And uh, it's that kind of combination that really uh, appeals. And okay. This is the voice of the purple finch. Honey, if you had some of this in a carafe, you could mix yourself a comic opera out of willow, 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 chemotherapy, and washing your socks in the sink. Know what I mean? I mean, what is is perched on the precipice where chat breaks into song, or it may be laughter breaking into Welsh, or Aunt Clara's pure lyrical harangue breaking over comers like Uncle Archie in her kitchen. I mean, life for sure is tragic, but honey, you aren't. Here's your purple guitar, adios. <laughs> and um, that's from where, Don? That's from Paradoxides, um, which is a, a book of poetry written uh, since the uh, award of the shell of the tortoise, right? Um, and I, sh I should mention about the award and 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 um, what it meant to me. Um, the large, the, the, first of all, the Shell of a Tortoise is a book of essays, and so I was really surprised that um, a book of essays should should even be nominated. But uh, of course, entirely pleased. Uh, prose doesn't come that easily to me at all, um, and. Um, um, so uh, having the, the uh, recognition for a, a piece of non-narrative prose was, I, I thought, really, uh, really important. And it's a, a real boost for me. The main essay in this, I think, uh, is uh, um, a book, uh, an essay about the mistaken point fossils called Ediacaran and Anthropocene. And um, that was important for me because it was, I mean, I came to Newfoundland in uh, 2006. And before I came, I knew about the mistaken point fossils, and they were um, they were a huge attraction. I, uh, you know, the, the fact of these early, early organisms being discovered—it was huge. I had gotten into geology when I lived in BC, and 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 uh, so that was one of the main things I that was the main things I did when I got here uh, early on. So having that uh, having that connection, having that recognition for this this piece, first was you know, the medium I'm not comfortable in prose and was also also this 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 fascinating phenomenon. I was uh, I was just uh, really, really grateful. And uh, also, a, uh, I know it was kind of an endorsement of, of that that move for me somehow. Yeah. So. Terrific. And uh, I, I, I should probably disclose I was a juror that year. And uh, yeah, and the thing about the BMO uh, prize is that it's all genres. So we were weighing your work against, I think it was a book of poetry and a novel. And, you know, it's kind of crazy to have to do that on the one hand, but, you know, 
it's a prize and uh, some somebody's got to win. But um, I think we were all pretty taken with uh, your work and um, and that really illuminating a part of a geomorphology here that very few of us have actually visited or know very much about. So yeah. um, bravo for that. It's become famous since now. It's a oh yeah, yeah. And so on That's and the Bona Vista sites have also come into play and they're just as interesting but as and as important geologically. So I gather. You know, it seems to be, uh, yeah, it's huge. And it puts us yeah. in, I just, that, that deep time thing is really crucial. I think that's a way, if you're like into an environmentalism, et cetera, makes us, you sort of, it, it impresses upon us as being citizens of the planet, being members of the, of the planet. This is the ecosystem that produced us. This is the planet that produced us. I was, I was just on the CBC, you know, the guy who wrote the whole earth catalog I'm blanking on his name right now. Is it? Oh, geez. Anyway, the guy who did the Holder catalog, he was like, like a hippie philosopher, like, you know, Buckminster Fuller, Kent Kesey, those guys kind of far out. Um, he was on the radio saying that deep time is as important as seeing the earth from space. So it has a kind of temporal equivalent to those images, which now everybody's screen top. And so on, I've seen the whole planet all at once. I kind of snap, yes, yes. You know, it's like, instead of all the sort of, you know, when you see that planet, well, obviously it's an organism. Obviously all the parts relate. You don't look at that and say, what an interesting collection of disparate, <laughs> disparate <laughs> things. Oh, yeah. you know, it sort of like proves the Gaia hypothesis and it's all went just like that, bam. And, and he was making the same claim for a deep time, which I thought was, pretty interesting that um, in some ways, contemplating things like the, the Ediacaran fossils um, uh, put us in connection with the earliest, earliest ancestors. The, the first things that moved from a single cell to multiple cells. Was, uh, so that blew my mind like that. And, uh, and so has the, you know, it continues to do so. This, this is another, the Paradox Cities book was another Invest, it was also inspired by another very important Newfoundland fossil, the, the Paradoxides trilobite from the Cambrian. So it's, yeah, it was a really kind of a, a real boost for me to get, you know, the recognition that the, the BMO. Great. Good. Okay, we're going to move to 2012, Andy Jones. And Andy, do you want to uh, tell us the title of your BMO winning prize book and read from it? Here it is. It's yeah. called uh, Jack and Mary in the Land of Thieves. And it's uh, based on a uh, Newfoundland folktale uh, that was collected by Herbert Halpert and John Widdowson uh, called uh, Jack and the Slave Islands, which is actually a story that uh, Shakespeare used in Cymbeline, the same story. and. Um, um, Boccaccio uh, had in the Decameron, and I forget what it's called there. Anyway, it's a story that's been told many times. Um, and the part I'm going to read is the kind of at the very end of the book. Uh, um, finally, it's only Jack and Mary and Baxter, who is their, their bird, their little um, uh, 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 minor bird, uh, left in the room. Uh, there's a long, long silence. Then Jack clears his throat and says, I suppose now I'm your servant. Yes, I suppose you are, says Mary, with a sting in her tongue. There's another long pause, then Mary says, come here, servant, and give me a kiss. Jack shuffles up and kisses her on the hand. There's another long silence. Then she says, you can kiss me now on the lips. I'm not sure I'll be any good at it, he says. You kiss me, she says. I'll be the judge of that. That's right. You're the master, and I'm the servant, says Jack, trying to get something on the go. Yes, she says, and don't you forget it. Mary's not rising to the bait. Well, he kissed her, and he kissed her good. It near took Mary's breath away, but she didn't let on, see. He says, oh my, he says, uh, I guess I'll have to do a lot of practice. We'll see about that, she says. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic, Andy. Oh my. It's all about the way you read it, though, I gotta say. 
um, tell us about tell us about the book and then you know uh, that moment of your name being called and all that oh that was really great i was so so happy i, I you know everyone says they don't expect to win it but i really didn't expect it <laughs> With the children's book. And anyway, I was just delighted. And and uh, my neighbor, I, I was so sure I wasn't going to win that I said to her, this little girl who lives next door, she's my little girl anymore. I said, you know, if I win this, I'll take your whole family out for Chinese food twice. <laughs> and so I got up and had to announce to her that I'd be taking her. So it was a, it was a great moment. I really was happy. And I took the money and I went to Slovenia uh, to uh, visit uh, Darka Ordeli, who did the illustrations for the book oh, uh -huh. and um, the beautiful illustrations. And, uh, and, and we got to work uh, together on, uh, uh, on an idea for a puppet show version of this, uh, of the book, uh, which uh, I'm working on right now uh, uh, with, um, uh, with um, uh, Jamie Skidmore at the university. So, so that was uh, you know, an immediate uh, uh, benefit of that award. Um, and uh, plus, it, it is very, 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 uh, for me, I really need uh, constant uh, a reassurance. And it was great to get that reassurance. Well, well deserved. And congratulations on that. I, I know I was at Government House when that was announced. I didn't know I wasn't on the jury, yet, but just a member of the board. And uh, I remember the sound of delight in the room when your name was announced. Um, I just think there was a great big hug of appreciation for everything you do and have done. So was good, it. good passage, good passage. Uh, 2013, some of you may recall or not, that was the year that Paul Boundring won and Paul passed away a couple of years ago. I think it's a couple of years ago now. So um, he's sadly missing from this Zoom gallery view. So 2014 is Megan Gale Cole. She's a double winner, so we'll hear from her twice. And Meg, why don't you tell us the name of your 2014 award-winning book and give us a little read. So uh, my 2014 award-winning book is Eating Habits of the Chronically Lonesome. And it is a short story collection published uh, here by Creative Book Publishing, Killer Press. Um, so I'm just gonna read a little section from the very last story in the book which is called, A Dog Is Not a Baby. Hazel promises herself that she will be more talkative the next time someone calls the house. She will contribute more than the list of the food she ate throughout the day. Egg sandwich for breakfast, warmed up some leftover soup for dinner, might put on a box of them chicken nuggets for supper, a slice of fruitcake for lunch. Her grandchildren will know the meal she's talking about because they know, not because they refer to their meals by the same names. No, all of Tiffany's meals are referred to as snacks. Steve don't even think about food as a meal because he's married and Martina's dinner is called lunch. For this, she goes to restaurants with her girlfriends and pays a swarm of money for spicy carrot soup. Burn them out right off you. Martina and her single ladies will discuss which dance to attend on Friday night as if it's a serious grown up topic. They won't discuss their husbands and children because they don't have any. They won't worry about what to make for supper because there's no one to cook for anyway. Supper is not even supper, it's dinner. Great, I remembered your reading. I don't know if you read that, but you did a great reading at Winterset uh, that Saturday night of that year. Um, that was a first award for you. And uh, how did that feel? What was that all about for you? I mean, I suppose, like many other people, I didn't expect to win. Uh, Alan Doyle uh, and Michael Crummy were the other nominated uh, artists, writers for that particular year. And most people uh, commented that they didn't even know who I was during the whole process leading up to the award because I wasn't um, like Newfoundland and Labrador famous. And so it kind of was um, 
like a really like validating experience for me. It made me feel like a sense of belonging in my arts and culture community. It was all very amusing. I built a fence. Great. I remember you mentioning then too that um, you had been largely playwriting and this was a shift of genre for you, if I recall correctly. Well, like most young writers, I started out writing poetry in childhood. Like I think that's fairly common and I moved into writing short stories. Uh, and then I went to the National Theatre School where I did the playwriting program. So the plays were quite a bit further developed, further advanced because I had technical training. With regards to the short stories, I was always writing them. I just didn't have any writer friends or any knowledge of how to be published as a writer. And so that just uh, learning the, how to navigate that whole process took longer than um, perhaps the playwriting did because I had gone to school. Right. Well, uh, boy, it's been an interesting journey since then. We'll come back to you for the 2019 uh, chat about that work. So we'll move on. Thank you to 2015, Sarah Tilly. Welcome and tell us about your award winning work and give us a little read. Sure. Um, this is my novel, uh, Duke. It's my second book um, published with Peddler Press. And it is um, a kind of experimental historical literary fiction, um, which could also be viewed as a really, really long poem. Um, it is based uh, very loosely on my great grandfather's story, um, William Marmaduke Tilly, and um, greatly inspired by his writing style. So the piece that I the little paragraph that I'm going to read is basically, um, for me, it's one of the central images of the work and the first image that really solidified itself in my mind when I began. Um, and it also gives a sense of the writing style going from prose into verse um, all the time. He's a very rhyme oriented, verse oriented person. I'm not saying his verse is good though. Um, <clears throat> so this is just um, a little passage about Duke. That's his, how he calls himself. Um, and he, there's a ritual that occurs with Duke and the serving girl, Jenny, um, in the attic. Um, I want to say more than that. She's at the trap, pulling down the ladder, headed up into the attic. You can see her legs with her skirt hiked between them and her fist. She has no stockings on. And on her left calf, she has five nipper bites, equidistant from each other, like the corners of a pentagram, bright red on white with tiny fine hairs you can only see when the light is just right and you're really close to her, as you might happen to be, if you were following her up the ladder, up into the attic, where I shall no longer go. Not I, no, never, never, never. And um, you want to tell us more about what that passage speaks to in the rest of the book? or I mean, I can. Uh, I guess uh, Duke, Duke carries a lot of shame um, in this novel, and it is in large part tied to um, immoral, uh, perhaps, um, relationships um, of varying types. So uh, this is one of the, the central relationships in his life is, is with a, a very young person who um, comes to their family to work and uh, comes having just given away a child uh, as a, a very young woman. Um, so uh, they develop a bond that I, I mean, I don't really want to go into the whole story. I yeah, just yeah. read the novel to um, fully follow this, but he is tied to Jenny um, in his heart for his whole life. And it's never a thing that could really exist. Um, so there's a deep longing in this character. I mean, for beyond this, he, he's a, a, a um, 
an anti-hero sort of uber flawed uh, person who finds himself in a strange position of trying to basically save his whole family. Um, and he's not up to the task really. So it's uh, a story of, of um, not really doing the thing you wanna do and not really actually making uh, a success of yourself, but um, just living, living anyway. Um, yeah, and I guess, I mean, this is a book that was greatly inspired by my, my family and by a, a huge trove of letters and logbook entries, journal entries that I was lucky enough to find with my father in a, our family house in Elliston, which is um, empty, we thought. Um, and the voices came out of those pages um, in incredible um, colorful detail to me, but they were full of gaps. And so it's the gaps where I really wrote the book. I wrote into mysteries that were in these um, sort of sparse letters and um, eventually found the freedom to really make fiction out of it. Uh, I mean, the, the relationship with Jenny is largely my imagined um, relationship within these, he keeps mentioning her, you know, in the, in the real letters, but what was it really? Uh, certainly not what it is in my book, I'm sure. Uh, so there is like this weird thing where I took real, my real family and completely, you know, um, remade it in a way. Um, that being said, I, it is still very true to his voice and a lot of the, his real text is in there. So it's um, a bit of a collaboration with ghosts in a way. Um, and I was just so pleased um, and beyond honored to win the BMO for this um, because it, I mean, it took me eight years uh, to make this book and it really meant a lot that other writers read it and um, value, valued something there. And also that my, my father was present as my guest um, and he got to witness this story being celebrated. Uh, so I'm pretty sure I did a clown turn as I got up um, at the BMO because I was so overwhelmed. I think I cried and tripped on my way to the stage, um, but it was incredible. And my dad was, my dad was crying in the very back row um, and that I'll never forget. So yeah, it was um, really a highlight for me. And uh, I remember Meg was on the jury. So thank you, Meg. Ah, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Yeah, that's great, Sarah. It's a great, great novel. Great. Oh, thank you. Uh, it is. It's wonderful. Intense read. It's an <laughs> intense read. Yeah. Just so, looking through it today, I got I got tense and I yeah. forgot how how yeah. much is in this book. Yeah, and there's actually, a lot. It seems like, did I even write it? I don't know. It's it's such a strange thing to look back at your work years later, especially if you haven't been doing much reading from it. And there's a world in here. And I yeah. It, it feels almost other than me, which is really wonderful. And that's a wonderful thing about books. I mean, it exists and it's, it's got its own life. Yeah. yeah. Well, good for you. That's great. <laughs> Terrific. Great, great to hear that story too, of that moment. Okay, so we'll move on to 2016 and Paul Rowe, over to you. Okay, so I've only ever received two phone calls in my life from uh, Reg Windsor at the Arts Council. And both times he said, I'm calling to tell you you've been shortlisted for the Winterset Award, you know. So if a third phone call ever comes from Reg, I'll just have this Pavlovian response <laughs> of like, oh, good news, good news. But uh, so uh, I was thrilled, of course. I mean, I think that phone call was almost better than uh, the moment, you know, when they, when they announced my name and said that, well, for the 26th, 16 year, yeah. So my novel is called uh, The Last Half of the Year. I even had little stickers made. Um, and it was actually uh, the winter set winter for 2016, yeah. Um, so I'll read the piece. It's really short. He approaches the pony, slips the knife under the rope, and begins a slow sawing motion. The blade, from years of stropping, curves to a fine point an exquisite tip which almost touches the watery surface of the eye. Jason sees his own pale face there, past the reflection of the dark moving blade. The pony snorts heavily but doesn't budge. 
I'll just leave it there. So I, I think uh, it's funny because I had that response too, and uh, that's how I just described when I went back to the book and I was going like, whoa, wow. But uh, I chose that piece because um, the novel is in three, there's three plot lines or three tranches, you know, and one is very sort of innocent and lyrical. It's about a, the young Jason. And then another is uh, uh, Jason's father. It's his story. And the story that there are kind of like resonances of Jason's own story in Saul, his father's story. And then that piece is from the sort of the present in this 18 year old lad's life who's going through, uh, he's going through enormous cataclysmic sort of change, really. So. And uh, and he's kind of walking a razor's edge, and so that 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 little element of like uh, nothing's really happened, but at any time you get a sense of something very wrong could happen uh, because he's making terrible decisions all the way along the way. So, um, so you know about the book. I mean, my first book, The Silent Time, found a bigger readership, really. I mean, my readership is in Newfoundland. I don't have a readership outside of Newfoundland. So. Oh, you don't know that. Uh, well, I don't know that. My, I, what, my first novel is in the Halifax Library, and I found it there, and I took it out, and it was like it had been checked out a whole bunch of times. So that's a really rewarding feeling there you go. for a writer, I think. So that was great. But uh, I don't know. I just always felt that people, maybe they were a little bit uncomfortable about the subject matter or something, and they, and I was a little bit hesitant about talking about it, too, because it's it's my coming-of-age story. And I had a very difficult coming of age and almost everything that happened to that kid in that book happened to me in real life. And, and, uh, you know, I never got to have that conversation, you know, but when I had my interview with Michael, like he, his question to me was, you know, the book does some really interesting things with time and there's a lot of, and it does. It moves there. So we talked about that for a while and then it kind of moved on. And there were two other people on the stage who had wonderful books to be talked about. And uh, so I don't know. I always felt that uh, it's a good book. But it it didn't really find I didn't think it didn't it certainly didn't sell very well and it didn't really find its readership but I'm still proud of it and uh, yeah so well maybe some listeners and viewers will be inspired to go pick it up and become part of your readers after this oh which is which is exactly why I'm saying this no I'm <laughs> uh, it's never too late to pick up a good book. But uh, I know everybody's books are great. About the other, I, I don't know if you're going to move on to the question of, uh, you know, awards and, you know, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. They are interesting. I mean, Andy said, like, everybody said that they didn't think they had a chance. But, you know, I actually did the math. And even though the illustrious Michael Crummy was on the short list and Robert, uh, Robert Chase, I, and then mine, we, that was the short list. And I kind of did the math and I thought, well, mine is a novel. Uh, Michael's writing, submitting poetry, which he's, you know, he's, he's a great poet as well, but poetry doesn't win as often as novels do. And Robert, it's his first effort. Uh, he's usually a dramatist. He's writing short stories. And then you look at the composition of the jury. And I mean, it's like, so you just, you can't count on anything. Like the uh, awards can't be the repository of your literary hopes. It just can't be. Mm. If you count on them for validation, you're going down the wrong road. You always have to be prepared for the worst and, you know, and be really thankful if the best happens, you know. But in the back of my mind, I had a niggling sort of a thought that, you know, maybe, just maybe, uh, I, I might win this, you know, so. And you were right. Interesting. And I was right. And, uh, and uh, yeah. yeah, and it's a great rush. It was a wonderful feeling and it's very validating and the money is great. Oh, good. Thanks. So 2017, over to you, Joel Thomas Hines. What are you reading? What was the award-winning work? And uh, tell us all about it. That's my book. Uh, my last book is called We'll All Be Burns in Our Beds Some Night, which I, it was a phrase I plucked out of my mother's mouth, I guess. I just picked uh, a section that's relatively clean uh, it's yeah, I know that's not easy. Yeah, this is um, this is a bit of a road story. A young hooligan who travels right across the country, and he he takes his licking uh, on the way across the country, and he's 
come to in a hospital in uh, somewhere in Alberta. And he's trying to piece the last week or so together. This is just a rundown of the physical damage that happens to him. Uh, the left eye is completely swollen shut now. There's a headache, a sharp one. Still seeing two of everything, although it's not as bad as it was this morning. The foot too, killing me. Toes on the left foot bashed and crunched in. However they manage that through these big army boots, big old shit stompers. Some tough guy Johnny is. Four fractured ribs, they says. All the fingernails on my right hand are shredded off like someone held my fingers against a grinding wheel. You can see the bone on two of my knuckles. Honestly, no clue how I came, how that came about. My arm is black and pocked with bits of asphalt in my mouth. Three of the front teeth gone and three or more or four more barely hanging on. My face, my jaw, they'll be wiring that shut soon as the swelling goes down. It's a strange feeling. I ain't never had my jaw busted before, like a door off its hinges. Try to open and shut my mouth, and one side of the jaw can't catch up and then finds it has nowhere to settle anyhow. It don't fit no more. Six stitches above my eye. The rest of my body, what's not bandaged up, is one big bruise. It burns and throbs and stings and pulsates all over, but it, it don't hardly hurt unless I thinks about it. What hurts, I guess, is the how, how it happened. You live your whole life on the edge of the battle, waiting for some fucker to get in your face. You learn to be ready for it. But how in the Christ was I supposed to be ready for that? A pack of teenage girls. <laughs> <laughs> well chosen, oh, for sure. That's yeah. one, one of the most dangerous, violent things that can happen to you out there in the world. Never happened to you? And teenage girls are supposed to be the worst they, when they gather around and start kicking, right? It happened to Johnny. Right on. And uh, like Paul, did you uh, calculate the odds of winning or were you surprised or when your name was called or? I mean, I had no expectations around it. I was happy to be involved. Um, you know, Wayne Johnson was on, on the bill too. And, um, oh God, she, her name escapes me right now. Not because I don't admire her book. It's just gone out of my, gone out it of my was head. Bridget, it was Bridget Canning, Joel. Canning, yeah. Oh, good memory. But, uh, you know, Wayne kind of paved the way for a lot of us. I didn't really know you could write about Newfoundland or do it from here or whatever not you know and uh, until i read things like the divine rhymes and stuff like that so i was very humbled to be on the bill with wayne and uh, so winning was not on my uh i just didn't really consider much about it but i tell you it's a it's an awful moment i was oh, so. my uh when you're at government house there it's just so it's it's hard right the night before the readings and all that they're great they're fun everybody's on the same footing the next day at government house is, is really tough i remember my first novel down to the dirt was also shortlisted for the winter set and it uh i got robbed i believe ed rich won <laughs> uh, also point out andy jones was on that jury too and i've never forgotten it every time i look at andy yeah. <laughs> um, but we were sitting there and you know that moment where you're all sitting together and you're on your best behavior, trying not to fidget and somebody's about to announce the winner. You've already been up and you've gotten your, uh, you've all gotten your plaques and everybody's on their best terms with each other. And the moment Ed's name was called, <laughs> the picture that came out in the in, in the telegram the next day with me looking at ed like i just wanted to rip his throat out <laughs> and i don't know if it was snapped in that moment or snapped if the picture was taken five minutes before that so i remember i went in and wayne and bridget were there and we were all talking i said listen i told him that story i said listen whatever you do whoever's name is called out just smile and look straight ahead <laughs> Right, because and I told him about that moment, 
And uh, I, I literally, you know, and then my name was called and I was totally humbled and surprised and I was not expecting it. And, you know, it was, uh, it was good. Uh, I remember talking about it before and uh, I've, I found the Winterset Award in particular for Newfoundlanders very personal. It's like, it's, it feels like more of an achievement than national awards and stuff like that. You're being embraced by your community, mm -hmm. and, uh, you, you know, your peers in a different way. And it, it was very, very meaningful to me. I, I, I took it very personally and it gave me, uh, it was, you know, you can't get hung up. You can't stop and breathe and rest on your laurels or anything. But for a moment, I was quite satisfied with the win. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I totally get what you're saying about the validation from your community. Yeah. yeah I, that's, I've heard so many artists and writers say that uh, about being, you know, being embraced by people yeah. you know, your peers here. You know. It can be quite alienating to step off the island, right? Yeah, yeah. So it was, it, yeah. Was, it was a fun, fun event. Awesome. That's great, Joel. That's great read too. And it's it's a wild book, man. <laughs> it's a wild <laughs> book. Yeah. Wild ride. Okay, we're gonna go to 2018 and Heather Smith. Over to you, Heather. All right, so my book is Ebb and Flow, and it is a middle grade novel, but I just think it's for everybody. Um, and it's written in verse, and it's about a boy who does something very unkind to a vulnerable person. He's living on the mainland, and he's sent home to Newfoundland to spend the summer with his grandmother. So I'm just going to read the first page. It's very quick. So the first poem is called Summer. One summer, after a long plane ride and a rotten bad year, I went to Grandma Joe's. It was my mother's idea. Jet, what you need is a change of scenery. I think she needed a change of scenery too, one without me. Because that rotten bad year, that was my fault. I wondered if a summer spent in a little wooden house on a rocky eastern shore would help us forget that. As the plane flew across the blue green ocean, I crossed my fingers and hoped. So that's the opening. Um, tell us more about the book, where that goes. Um, yeah, so it's basically about a, uh, it's about coming to terms with something that you've done in your past. Um, and, you know, as a children's writer, every children's book I write, whether it's a picture book, middle grade, young adult, there's always obstacles for the main character. And for this character, Jet, his biggest obstacle is forgiving himself. Um, so with his grandmother's kind of just listening, basically, throughout the summer, uh, it's revealed what it is that he did. And he kind of comes to terms with that. So, yeah. And do you remember winning? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, so for me, winter set uh, was really huge. And I, I had to echo what um, Joel said, because uh, being away and then getting like recognized in your home province is really, really huge. It really means a lot. Um, and for me, the whole, the award was great, awesome. But for me, it was the little connections and all of the experiences I had along the way. So from the minute the long list was announced, kind of like looking at that list and, you know, going to the library and getting the books and uh, getting to know the people on the long list. And then the short list is like, oh my gosh, I made it to the short list, short list. Um, getting to know, like going to Newfoundland and getting for the events and getting to, you know, I, I had a grand chat with Joel at the rooms, you know, and that that's just one of those little connections. That's so nice. and. It was Melissa Barbo and Robert Chafe were the finalists. Um, sitting with them at, at uh, Government House and just that sense of, I don't know, like Megan touched on a community, right? Like you're, you're, you find your people. <laughs> and for someone like me who's an introvert and I sit at home and I don't have a huge circle of friends, um, when I 
when I do meet my fellow writers, I, I do, you get that sense of belonging. So that's what Winterset meant for me. Great. And you're speaking to us today from Ontario. Yeah, I'm in Waterloo. Yeah. Yeah. So we're hoping maybe you'll be able to come for the festival itself and we'll all be listening to this with you present. I would love that. <laughs> yeah. So stay, stay safe in that I will. province in the meantime. <laughs> and uh, our final uh, read is back to Meg again, uh, who won in 2019, uh, a book that became a hot property on Canada Reads. So um, interesting, Meg, to go from the 2014, 29, five short years, and boy, a lot of things blew up in good ways for you. Why don't you tell us the title and maybe read a little bit from it and talk about it. Um, so my uh, debut novel is called Small Game Hunting at the Local Coward Gun Club. And I'm going to read the opening paragraph. And I chose it because it establishes a lot of the tension and relationships that exist throughout the novel with regards to rural and urban divide, uh, classism, racism. And it really sets Newfoundland up as a character in the book, which is pretty consistent throughout. Like St. John's is as much a character in the novel as uh, the many protests. So this is from the beginning prep and it's um, Olive. Olive waits below the sad mural painted in memory of some long ago drowned boy. She can see up and down Duckworth Street from her perch, though there's not much to see this early in the morning a scattered taxi slides by carrying fiendish looking passengers who attempt to discreetly smoke from barely cracked windows. Discretion is a skill they have fallen out with, but they don't know that yet. They still fancy themselves stealth, piling four park applied humans into a single toilet stall, scarves dangling beneath the door, telling tales on them all. Volume control is a thing of delusion in the confined spaces they inhabit. It will be years before this is fully realized by those who escape the scene or are thrown into adulthood by overdose or pregnancy. These lucky few will feel overwhelmingly retroactively embarrassed by their one-time rock star fantasies. Olive can hear them bawling about their supposed betrayals as clouds of tobacco smoke and slurry syllables updraft skyward through the slightly parted window. So that's the beginning of small game hunting. Um, and I guess with regards to winning the second one, it was uh, really spectacular because you worry that the first time is a reaction to you being discovered or being new and that perhaps they made a mistake or it was a fluke. Um, there's also, uh, it was a real kind of uh, honor for me to be on the list with Elizabeth Panashwi and Michael Crumman because I thought that the three of us at that time in Newfoundland and Labrador's literary history represented so many different aspects of our culture and our heritage and our art scene. And so I was really pleased to be included in that group because between the three of us, we encompass a broad like uh, array of lived experiences. And so the narratives were very diverse. Um, my book is also very critical of our home and I don't really, um, I'm, I'm non-relenting in some of the examinations of toxic masculinity and classism and divisions. And so it was nice to know that you can write a book like that and still uh, be considered award worthy. Anyway, thanks. Yeah, well, all true congratulations for that and it what strikes me listening to all of you is um you're also different but you sort of spoken to 
the other contenders, Wayne uh, Johnson and Elizabeth Panashaway and Michael Crummy and Robert Chase. So this community just from talking sort of has expanded beyond the borders of the Zoom gallery um, and points to just how rich and amazingly rich the writing is in this teeny tiny godforsaken island we live on or province we inhabit. So uh, I, I think that's really inspiring for people who are who are listening, both you know from the province and beyond, because we're aiming for a larger listening audience now that we're zoomable. And you know, one question that always comes up whenever writers are present, and you know, you've all answered this question, I'm sure a zillion times. Um, is, you know, what's the advice? You've all had different journeys, but similar in some ways to getting to the moment of winning that prize. You know, what advice do you give young writers today? Anything come to mind? Paul, you have a, did you raise your hand? Just like wave or jump in. I, I didn't, but uh, I thought about that. And I mean, the thing is to just write, isn't it? I mean, it's just park yourself and start writing and, uh... That's a good start. Yeah, well, we can't get more basic than that. Meg? I think um, for me, for, me uh, from my perspective, the most important thing is to write the book that is meaningful to you, like to write the book that is in your voice and that you need to write, regardless of whether or not it is in, going to be commercial or very popular or well received like I think it is more important to ensure that the book is significant in your development as a writer than to think beyond like where it might land because if you're writing toward the readership they're going to sense that like they're going to sense the inauthenticity or the contrived nature of the book and ultimately it doesn't really contribute to the overall cultural canon that we're trying to create here artist wise and so I hope that everybody is writing whatever weird novel and short story collection or play that they they need to like I, I want us all to be even more diverse and rich sounding yeah no absolutely um good advice anybody else Sarah yeah I guess um well, my, my first thought is always that uh, you should just ignore all the writing advice, <laughs> honestly. Um, <laughs> but um, for me, I think the one thing I can impart as beneficial is to let go as much as you can of judgment, prejudgment, planning, and thinking when you sit down to do your first work. Um, I see the first draft as a an opening um, and then the work of editing is to take the mass and sculpt it back. Um, but if I don't allow myself permission to just get messy to begin with, I never can end up with anything that's worth pursuing mm -hmm. through editing. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's about, um, my best work is always about letting the, um, the critical side take a back seat for a while and then come back in during the refining process. So I, I guess that is sort of about being as weird as you want and really writing the book you want to. Um, it's, it's also about daring yourself to sit, sit down and just let it all out, knowing that you can come back later and, and make it beautiful and make it the best it can be. Yeah. Yeah, well, that actually does sound like good advice. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other thoughts on that? I would say, Heather? yeah, I would say um, just like don't overthink it and don't compare yourself to others. So, I mean, if you're a young writer and you're like watching this panel and we're all here and we're winners and we're in little boxes like the Brady Bunch, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, like you can find that inspiring to hear our stories. Um, but I think you need to own that you are a writer as well. Um, you don't have to be reaching for somebody else's goal. You just do you basically. Like believe in yourself and 
just don't compare. I see a lot of young writers who are just constantly down on themselves because they don't feel as good as. Sit down and write. And the more you write, the better you'll get. And, and, and if you're really passionate about it, um, you will get there. So, oops. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's my advice. <laughs> Paul? I think it's worth noting too that, you know, the decision to write, it's, it's an artistic decision, but it's also a life decision, you know? So that going along with that commitment to writing something will probably, certainly in the long term, involve making life decisions about how you're going to live your life, yeah. how much money you're going to be able to live on, how you're going to be able to arrange your time. And, and uh, you know, like for me, uh, a key moment was being able to go to BAMP, for example. That first uh, writing studio I did in BAMP was five weeks of writing. I mean, it was, that was really validating to be amongst a group of 20 writers for the first time to read my work publicly for the first time. Uh, like all of that was so formative, but I had to be in a position where I could, you know, make that application, take that time, make that journey, do that work, uh, all of that. And, you know, that, and, yeah. you know, as, as, a, as a theater artist as well, you know, someone who works in theater as well, like I had to give up full-time teaching in my early forties, which I did. And, uh, you know, I had to say, okay, now I'm going to be juggling balls here uh, to try to keep keep a life going uh, while I carve out the time in my existence for creative work. So it's a life decision and, a, and an artistic decision. I've met a few lawyers, you know, who are very impressed. And you say, well, what are you going to BAMP for? I say, oh, I'm going out there because I'm working on a book. I remember this one guy saying, yeah, I had a key moment there, you know, where I thought I wanted to be a writer or go to law school. And he's sitting behind the desk, you know. 14 years a lawyer and he seemed a little tiny bit sad about it you know but I'm sure he probably sleeps quite well at night as well anyway <laughs> maybe on a better mattress uh, Don yeah I was just, well, actually connects with what Paul was saying uh, I met Paul at BAMP actually uh, oh. uh, on that occasion and I was like the um I mean the thing I was going to say is like absolutely indulgent on obsession with the material and that this speaks to what everybody else has said too, is like not being worrying about awards and public, et cetera, that you allow your obsession, which is a love of the material to just carry you. I was, I, I was already obsessed with rocks and stuff when I, when I was, uh, met Paul at Banff all those years ago. And I was at the point, at that point of moving to Newfoundland, I was coming as writer in residence and I, I wanted, I was already into Newfoundland geology as a, a topic and uh, reading it up on it. And Paul said, you should read J.P. Howley's reminiscences if you're a writer and you're going to Newfoundland, you're interested in geology because he was like that his first geologist and actually important early Newfoundland writer, 19th century Newfoundland writer. So I did before I, before I, before I left. And it was fascinating. It has a great introduction by um, Patrick O'Flaherty and um, which sets it as a kind of literary text as well as the, all this sort of like natural history and the geology of Newfoundland, early geology of Newfoundland. Uh, and one of the things, uh, this is kind of, one of the things led me right to the book, the next book of poetry was that uh, Howley said, he, really, he has these wonderful passages where he, he visits people around and talks not just about the geology, but about what kind of life they're living, how they're working in their homesteads and et cetera. And he stayed at Branch, he said, People here at Branch have found these amazing fossils, the Paradoxides fossils, and how we actually do a little picture of them in his, his margin. And I read all that, et cetera, and then I came here. After I'd been here a little while, uh, Marlene and I were at uh, Cape St. Mary's and we stopped at Branch to have lunch, eat lunch on the beach. <laughs> we're walking along and I said, you know, Howley says, you might find a paradoxides fossil around here, et cetera. And I was waxing on this in my way, and Martin pointed it down, she said, you mean like that? <laughs> and I said, oh. yeah, like that. You know, it's like, it's like if you go golfing with somebody who's never golfed before and they hit a hole in one and they say, was that good? <laughs> so, anyway, I got over my little snit and, uh, and uh, this book came out of it basically because of the paradox studies fossil so fat, amazing, et cetera. This is part of the obsession and also keeping your ears open. If somebody like Paul Rose says you should read a book, go read it. You know? 
Well, good advice. There you go. Lots of lines of continuity here for sure. Yeah. Um, I just kind of switch to a couple of other questions for you all. <clears throat> I mean, one of the things that people ask also about is about um, how the pandemic, um, here we are in this moment, right, in 2021, hoping to see a return to, I don't know, some other time or new time, whatever it's going to be, but we're evolving into a different kind of sense of the social for sure. Um, how has it been for all of you? Have you written more or less? Have you been in a different groove? Has your life not really changed? Um, How has it affected your creative process? You're thinking about things. Joel, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to you and you're muted. So I'm kind of curious about how you've spent your creative time. I obviously making music. Uh, I spend a lot of my so-called creative time feeling guilty. You know, Why is that? I don't know. I'm low to admit it's taken a while for it all to get to me, but I think after the winter here, the, the second lockdown here in Newfoundland really kind of got in under my skin. I think we were all so cocky about being the safest place on earth and then boom, you know. Um, I'm, I, I feel like a, an observer most of the time. I don't feel a part of it. I, I, I generally don't get involved in what's going on in the world and I try and exist in my own time, but it's pretty freaky out there. I gotta say, you know, I ran into a, an old friend the other day. I was driving downtown somewhere and uh, I saw her and I go, oh, wow. You know, I've been meaning to catch up, meaning to talk to her. And, I stopped in my truck and she looked and she had bags in her hand. She just backed away from the truck. I was like, mm. and then I realized, oh, COVID, yeah. And uh, I saw the world through her eyes for a moment. And like, I, I, I don't, I'm not quite like that. People can come in, uh, I don't know. But uh, it's it's been strange. And, you know, I lead a fairly um, isolated life in the best of times where where I'm in total isolation pretty much and then I'm out there and you know riding some big wave and working amongst a lot of people and then I go back so it's it's a strange balance for me but um yeah I'm loath to admit that I've just gotten a bit down and I've uh, I I I had to acknowledge that I was starting to uh, indulge in a really kind of hopeless outlook like, for example, what, whatever you're, you're doing, I, I do a number of different creative things, but, you know, I'm writing a book and at some point you go, well, who cares, man? Who, who cares if you, uh, why does the world need another book? Why does the world need another song? Who cares if you, if, if you ride out the week uh, on some kind of creative wave? And I really, and I started to see signs of depression, which not good for me, you know? And uh, so, yeah, it's been a battle. It's been, uh, uh, you know, I like to think I'm really resilient person, individual, and that I've, I've come through a lot of slaughter and everything. But uh, yeah, it's been getting under my skin a little bit, for sure. Yeah, I, well, that's a pretty clear, honest account for sure. I'm. I'd be shocked if others didn't share to a degree what you're talking about, actually. Uh, others, anybody else want to weigh in? Andy, how's it been for you? What Joel said, basically, uh, I was doing okay at the beginning and I do feel I'm outside of it. I do feel that my only job is to stay alive and be it, not be another old person who was put in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think so. I'm not really very active in doing anything about it or, or trying to do anything about it. And I uh, sort of felt at first like I, it wasn't affecting me. And now, and now I think it is. Uh, uh, lately, it's uh, been, um, uh, yeah, leading to depression, I think. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Have you been able to continue with work, right? And uh, I have. Uh, you know, uh, been starting, stopping, starting, and stopping, starting, and stopping. Um, and um, 
I had a couple of little things I had to do, which were great. And, um, but that, that same feeling that I'm having a bad case of, you know, who cares about this uh, thing that I'm writing. And um, uh, if I don't write it, uh, what difference is it gonna make? I sort of feel like, like I'm writing a, sometimes you get the feeling when you're a student uh, that nobody cares about your term, term paper. Uh, even the professor doesn't care. So you had to be self-motivated. So I'm sort of in that world. Yeah, I get it. Others, anybody else? Meg? I um, kind of, I suppose, respond to crisis in a slightly different manner. I have a tendency to, to double down. Like I have a, a, a kind of work ethic that uh, motivates me to go even harder in the direction that I'm traveling in. And so the pandemic uh, kind of made it even more hard to ignore the precariousness that a lot of people in Newfoundland and Labrador experience in their daily lives. Like a lot of the things that I explore in my work became really like, um, clear and even more illuminated in the way that the pandemic affected young people and old people and marginalized people in rural and urban areas of the province. And so I suppose I invested those, the anger that I felt in response to that into my new poetry collection, which is probably one of the most um, challenging things I've ever written because I am holding myself uh, more accountable like it is more autobiographical than most of my work and I guess the intention there is to not expect of others what I wouldn't be forward coming with myself and so if I want us to be uh, introspective and uh, if I want us to deal with our intergenerational trauma and acknowledge the damage that has been done then I kind of set out this goal to acknowledge all the things that have presented themselves as obstacles to me in my life. And so that's what I did. I wrote a lot of really difficult poems and now they're gone to the printer. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, and I've been working on a play about Muskrat Falls. Oh boy. Yeah. Yes, I had heard you were doing that. Well, I'd say both both those pieces would be highly anticipated. And there are readers out there for everybody who want to have this world interpreted in some way through your creative I, abilities. I, I guess though, part of it is like, it's something that like, I felt like I needed to do for myself. Like I am so critical of uh, the kind of late stage capitalism that we're living through in Newfoundland and Labrador that I really wanted to have a much better understanding of how we got to this place. And so you have to kind of examine how you got to where you are and then mm. move out. And so that's mm. kind of been my journey during these past like, I don't know, 18 months. Interesting. Anybody else, any thoughts on that, Heather? Um, yeah, for me, the pandemic, I think I quickly learned to let go of things I can't control, um, which was my way of just coping with everything that was going on. And so I, I have done a lot of writing because um, there's not much else I can do. So trying to think, well, you know, what can I do? I can write. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, but I also just wanted just to say to Andy and Joel, um, I mean, I know I understand uh, what you're saying and where you're coming from. And I really empathize. And I, and I know that words don't <laughs> mean a lot when you're in that mind frame, but as a big fan of both of you, um, I do care <laughs> what you're writing and I can't wait to see what's coming out from you both. So I just felt compelled to say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, here, here, absolutely. I'm sure you're speaking for a lot of people, for a lot of people, so please, keep going. Absolutely. And, you know, we decided that, yes, we had to because of the pandemic, 
uh, deliver something to our, you know, our loyal winter set participants. And this was obviously the most convenient way to do it. But we then thought, well, you know, we're, we're not exactly New Zealand, but we're, we're relatively secure here uh, right now. And if public health directives permit, we'll be allowed to have, you know, 100 people together at the beaches in August, uh, when I hope everybody is sitting there watching this live with all of you. And um, I started tossing the idea about being in person in Eastport in August around. And I mean, man, the pickup was incredible. Not a person said they, they couldn't imagine it. People are starving for that kind of uh, celebration really celebration of just being in person with other people, let alone everything else that we reading or thinking or talking about. So uh, I am hoping knock all woods that, you know, we, we are actually listening to this uh, with, uh, with a good audience, perhaps safely distance, uh, but nonetheless all under the same roof. So that's, we're all kind of hanging on for that moment for sure. Uh, Sarah, Dawn, any thoughts about any of this? I, I guess I, I have a bit of a different perspective maybe because I'm chronically ill and immunosuppressed. And um, so even if everyone else is gonna be gathering together, I probably still won't be until I get my second uh, vaccination. I still don't have my first one. Um, for oh. me, this past year has been, um, a process of watching the world come into my world in a little bit of a way. Um, when you're chronically ill, um, you live a life of semi-isolation anyway. And um, I've actually <laughs> had a, a sort of feeling of relief in a weird way um, because the pace of life has um, come more into alignment with sadly with the way that I already live um, so I probably won't be there with you all and I'll of course desperately wish I was um, but for me and people like me like we're not we're still not you know taking any chances so um, yeah it's been very interesting watching the reactions of other people as they investigate what it's like to have a more um, slower paced, less um, engaged yeah. in real time with people kind of existence. Can you still find value in your life? Can you still find joy in your life? Can you still find peace in your life? Um, and it's hard. Um, so I'm hearing, you know, the struggles others are having with this and I really empathize. Um, but I think there's also a lot of worth and value to be found in a smaller life, um, a smaller scope. And actually maybe some really surprising things can be found there. Um, and another thing is this connectivity that we never ever took advantage of before. I'm talking about literal Zoom and other such things, which I, I love and hate in equal measure. But honestly, I've had theater gigs this year from my house that I would never have even been invited to before because I couldn't physically go to the place for the number of hours required or whatever it is. So for me, this actually has been um, an opening kind of year in which I have been um, challenge to actually expand my sense of artistic practice from within my home into the world and to really embrace like what I actually can do from here. Um, more so than I, I was thinking about it before because before it's like, this is my struggle and here's the whole world doing this other thing. I actually was in sync in, in a greater way for a while. <laughs> Yeah. And had way more theater gigs this year than I've had in a long time. Digital oh, theater. Oh, so I actually haven't yeah. written in a very long time. And now I'm getting back into it because I've been so busy doing like design for digital films or like making my own digital film. Um, it's been really very strange and kind of exciting. Well, that's great. And I hope you get back soon. That will certainly take some of the pressure off. Although we're always going to have, I think, that sense still of self-protection, even with double vaccine. 
it'll be a while if we ever come out of this at all. Uh, Don or Paul, any any thoughts on any of this for you? Don? Well, yeah, I I, I found it. Um, it hasn't really interrupted my <laughs> to put a lavish term, my creative rhythms because I'm halfway to a hermit anyway. I'm never on this medium. Um, but I'm very interested in the paradox that, like Sarah has pointed out, that many people have actually wider exposure because of Zoom and so on and so mm. forth. So, uh, as a cultivator of unpopular genres, I, I, I'm able to cultivate them without feeling <laughs> without feeling that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just weird and so on. So just uh, being uh, connected with the natural world, which I do a lot and, and so on, it's, it's, it's been... That's been fine. The problem has not been so much then on the depressive side, but more on the anxiety side. So it's like people who are away, my kids are in more dangerous places. And so I worry about them all the time and I'm uh, you know, not able to visit them and they can't visit me here. So that's, that's, been the, that's been the main issue as far as the downside of it is concerned for it personally. Then there's just the wider anxiety of you know, what's happening. Will the world come back? socially come back to anything that resembling what it was before and audit too, you know, audit too. It, it, there's so many issues that we face that in some ways, this main issue has brought us, made us more aware of one hope that one can hold on to that awareness. It, for example, with the matters in the environment and climate change, for example, which is more top of mind for me. Um, one hope that we don't go back to the same old, same old. Yeah. yeah. Paul? I directed a, I directed a play last summer online. I directed a Shakespeare play, Pericles Print Attire. Uh, it was a, a steep learning curve and an interesting experience. Ultimately, a little unsatisfying because you don't the presentation little aspect is kind of missing. You don't get that rush of going before a live audience. If I, uh, it's not something I care to do again. Quite frankly, mm -hmm. so this year we're, uh, but but at least I kept the contract, you know, and uh, I made some money doing that. This year we're really hoping. I mentioned the play earlier that Andy's done some writing for to do uh, Pericles Prince of Tyre um, outdoors. So we're really hoping for that 100 people gathering and and yeah. getting some shows in. So that's, that's good. I or... uh, Shakespeare by the Sea actually. Shakespeare by the Sea. Okay. Uh, I lost. <laughs> some theater work o over the year due to that the, then but then that made me eligible for some government support because i couldn't get work and uh and then about a year ago i started working on a, a new novel and it's kept up you know i am on one of those uh, kind of waves that uh joel talked about earlier so i feel really good about that it seems sustained and it seems real and uh and uh so I, I, i'm kind of beating away at that taking a break now to direct this show but I have a strong feeling that this is finally after five years, you know, I've got, I'm, I've got something by the tail and I can just ride this out. So, so it hasn't been all bad. It hasn't been that bad for me. Uh, Good. Yeah. Interesting. Well, um, we're, we're pretty much winding uh, to the end of the time we have. I'm, I think what I'm going to ask you to do as um, parting shots is, because uh, I asked you this in advance, if you had the chance to spend a day with a, an author living or dead, mm -hmm. just tell me who that would be. Who, who comes to mind as somebody you'd love to hang out with for 24 hours? Just curious. You don't have to tell us why or anything like that. Um, who wants to start? Come on. I'll go. I'll go. <laughs> okay, Heather. Um, so I would have to say um, James Harriet, who wrote All Creatures Great and Small, because I'm obsessed with the Yorkshire Dale, and I just want to be out in the Yorkshire Dales with my hand up a sheep, <laughs> helping him birth, <laughs> helping him birth uh, an animal. Yeah. So it's okay. a weird answer, but that's that's it. <laughs> I don't know. There's no weird answers here, Sarah. Um, I'm going to say my current literary obsession, which is Ali Smith, a Scottish novelist who um, is incredibly playful with language. Um, but uh, a caveat that I kind of think meeting your 
literary heroes might be not the greatest idea and <laughs> we're, we're maybe not as exciting in person as on the page. Yeah, well, who knows? That's part of the mystery. Joel, how about you? I was just going to say Jim Morrison. Uh -huh. Okay, Paul? I'm going to say, well, I might counter that with Bob Dylan, but I, uh, I, uh, I think it would be Tolstoy, you know, I just like to follow him around the estate all day. And then uh, at the, I'd love to be there for that moment when at the end of the day or whenever it was, he went into a room and sat down and wrote in longhand the next chapter to <laughs> War and Peace or Anna Karenina. Just love to be there to see that. Yeah, well, you need more than a day to watch all that unravel, but good. Meg? Sharon Pollock just passed away recently. Yeah. She playwright that meant a lot to me. I met her once at theater school and we spent some time together. And I guess over the last decade, I let that relationship kind of fall away. And I, I have that regret that people get when you lose someone where you wish you had made the uh, attempt to let them know how meaningful they were to you and to your like um, career trajectory. And so, yeah, I would, I would settle that if I had an opportunity to speak with you. Yeah, right on. Uh, when uh, her, the news of her passing came out the other day, a friend of mine wrote and said, who's Sharon Pollock? Why, you know, what's the big deal? And, oh, there is a world out there who was very devoted to her work. And she was, you know, a trailblazer, certainly for Canadian lit, women in Canadian lit. Uh, absolutely. Andy, how about you? Uh, uh, Ken Campbell, I think. Oh. A B British uh, playwright who, uh, and comedian that I have to work with and who has been almost possessing me for the, the last week or so. Oh, well, that's not a bad possession yeah. as they go. Uh, many of us had the privilege of seeing Ken perform live, uh, spectacular, memorable, unforgettable shows yeah. in town. So, yeah. Uh, it was a big influence on me. Don? Well, probably, you know, it's probably provoked by your question. This occasion would be Paul Bowdrain, I think. I like him. Mm. And not just to sort of express admiration, renewed admiration for a wonderful writer, um, but also have arguments. You know, he's a great arguer. He's really, you know, have any disputes, you know, over coffee or beer somewhere would be fabulous. I mean, yeah. So, yeah. Much, much missed. Good. Yeah. Well, there's no shortage of people to argue with in the, these parts, I can tell you that. Um, so that's one thing that's kept on the go. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all so much. It's really been humbling to just listen to you and uh, hear where you're at uh, so candidly and um, eloquently. And I'm sure everybody listening to this feels the same way. Deep appreciation for everything you do. Please keep, keep at it. I'm hoping that with the exception of Sarah, we'll all be together really soon. So keep the faith, stay healthy and safe and um, look for the light and all of that. So best wishes. Thank you all very, very, very much.